Good morning, Calvary family, and welcome to our services today, December the 6th, our second Sunday of Advent. Last week, we were looking at hope and recognizing that our only hope is actually found in Jesus Christ. And today, we want to look at the second Sunday of Advent, and that is preparation. So here's a question for husbands and wives. How early is too early to start preparing for guests that are coming to the house? Probably if you were listening in our household, my answer would be something like at least five or ten minutes before they arrive. But my wife might have a little bit different answer. But I wonder if any of you might think that, uh, let's say, 700 years in advance is too early to start preparing. Well, one of the things that we look at today is the prophecy concerning the preparation for the coming of Christ. And actually, in the message today, we're going to be looking at the one who was sent to prepare the way. I want to read, first of all, out of Isaiah chapter 40, and uh, beginning at uh, verse number one, comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken." Isaiah is foretelling some 700 years before the coming of the Messiah, of one who will be sent to prepare the way of the Messiah. Preparation. God was not preparing kind of like last second in sending Christ as the Messiah. In fact, his preparation was not even a response to the fall of Adam and Eve, but rather his preparation was all part of his plan from eternity past knowing that we would need a Savior, one to rescue us, and preparing the way to send the Messiah. One other passage I want to read this morning, just as we look at preparation, and it's found in Luke chapter uh, chapter 1, I think is where we want to go. Luke chapter 1, actually Luke chapter 2, sorry. Luke chapter 2, and this is talking about Mary and the announcement to her about her birth. The angel has come and told her, you will give birth, and uh, the Holy Spirit will be the one who gives you this child within you, and this child will be the Savior, Jesus himself. And I want to pick up on this because this leads into our message even this morning. In verse 34, and Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? So she asks a very genuine question and how she'll know this is to take place. And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, Your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month which her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So Elizabeth is introduced here, her cousin, and being told that she is pregnant with a child who we'll see in just a few moments in the message is John the Baptist, the one who was sent to prepare the way. As we think about preparation, we can be asking our own selves, what are we doing to prepare for the Messiah? What are we doing to prepare in anticipation of the advent, the coming of Christ the child? So last week we had the candle for hope, and this week we have the candle for preparation to help remind us of what God is going to be doing and what he has promised to do in sending his son and one to prepare the way for him. God, I thank you again for your wonderful plan in sending the Messiah. We thank you for preparation. And I pray that even today, as we look in just a few moments and open the scriptures and we see some of the truths concerning John the Baptist, and as we consider even the aspect of repentance as being part of this preparation, that our hearts would truly be turned towards you. And with great anticipation, we would prepare our own hearts for the coming of Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Good morning once again, Calvary, as we are looking uh, this morning at our second message in the series throughout the Christmas season, Proclamation, Prayer, and Praise. We're going to look specifically this morning at John the Baptist. Just before we get to it, though, I just want to remind you about the daily devotionals. I want to encourage you to join with us all together as we are going through each day 
and uh, looking at different aspects of the Christmas season. And uh, I love, again, Paul David Tripp's book, uh, Come Let Us Adore Him. And uh, I have written some adaptations to his devotions. Um, if you don't have the book, and sending those out on um, early morning, uh, 6 o'clock, I think they come out into your email. If you're not getting that, contact the church office. But uh, whether you're in the book or you're reading through the devotionals, I encourage you to join along with us uh, throughout the month. And while we can't be together, we can be together in spirit and uh, reading along in the same thing as well. But for today, let's jump into the message and uh, we'll look at uh, John the Baptist, the one who has prepared the way uh, or the preparer of the way for Christ to come. If you have your Bibles, we're going to look at a, several different passages of Scripture, but uh, maybe if you want to hold your finger back on Isaiah, we'll be there in just a moment, and then we're going to skip back into the New Testament. We'll be looking in Luke chapter 2, Matthew chapter 3, and John chapter 1. So looking at a number of different passages, we won't take the time to read each of those passages, but we'll pull out some specific aspects uh, throughout those passages. John the Baptist is uh, rarely spoken about when it comes to the birth of Christ. Probably the one point that we read in the Advent uh, lighting of the candles this morning uh, would be the time when Mary went and visited Elizabeth, and John the Baptist is six months uh, along in the pregnancy there. Elizabeth, I should say, is six months along in the pregnancy with John the Baptist, and uh, we see that he leaps in her womb when Mary uh, enters into the room, and Jesus, who is already in the womb of Mary as well. So that's probably the first time where we see him show up on the scene and uh, where he plays a part in the Christmas story. But remember, the Christmas story, the coming of Christ, is much more than just the birth of Christ, but it actually expands all the way through his ministry, his death on the cross, his resurrection as well. So while we look at John the Baptist, we recognize that he's actually a key figure, not so much in the actual birthday of Christ, but in the rest of his ministry and what is taking place and preparing for the Messiah to actually accomplish the work that he intended to come and accomplish, which is rescuing mankind and restoring mankind. So when we look at him, though, there are a couple of things that we see about this announcement. We know the announcement and the miraculous birth when it comes to John the Baptist. Uh, we know about his name, John. And uh, remember in the passage that we read a couple of weeks back, it was, why are you choosing John? That's not a family name. We know also that he was uh, dedicated with a special vow when the angel comes and speaks to Zacharias and to Elizabeth, telling them he is not to drink wine or strong drink. We know also an unusual thing that takes place, which is unusual to us because once we receive Christ, the Spirit indwells us. But remember, in this time, it's still what we would consider the Old Testament period. But John the Baptist is told that he will uh, be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be upon him from birth. And uh, interesting enough, also we read a little bit later on about Elizabeth, that this Holy Spirit is upon her as well. But that is unique to John the Baptist as well. Some other unique characteristics about him. Uh, if we go back to Matthew, we'll see this in a few moments, but he was dressed in an unusual way. He did not dress according to the fashion of the day, but kind of had his own style, camel hair and a leather belt. Also, he didn't really keep to the traditional diet of the day. The Bible talks about his diet specifically was locusts and honey. And then we also know about his location. Where was he preaching? He was preaching out in the wilderness. It seems like if we we're going to go and do a church plan or we wanted to gather a crowd and we had some interesting news that we wanted to share with them or, or very passionate news we wanted to share with them, we would go to where the people are. But it seems that John the Baptist goes out to the wilderness. And what we find later on is that the people actually go to him to hear what he has to say. We also know that his message was what we would refer to as a message of repentance. And then along with that, we find that John the Baptist is the one who baptizes Jesus and then going all the way to the end of his life, which was actually before the death of Christ, we find that John is actually beheaded. So a very unusual life, a unique life, but nonetheless, he is described even by Jesus himself as the greatest man born of woman. So what a fascinating description that Jesus himself actually gives. And he is the one who is sent to prepare the way. And so this morning, I want us to take a look and see about the proclamation concerning him 
uh, look at the prayer concerning him, and then we'll also see the praise concerning John the Baptist. So follow along with me. First of all, we find the proclamation, and we read back in Isaiah just a few moments ago. If you have your finger there, you can look once again, but we see that the proclamation about John the Baptist was told by Isaiah as a prophecy long before the birth of John the Baptist. And while no name was attributed to that, once we get into the New Testament, we find multiple times, many different people, including Jesus himself, who points to John the Baptist as the one that Isaiah was actually talking about in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse number three. But Isaiah says, one is going to come who is going to prepare the way he will be described as a voice crying in the wilderness. There's another passage also in Malachi, very similar to this, Malachi chapter three and verse number one. It says that one will come as my messenger and he will prepare the way of the Lord. Now remember, all this is at the end of the time when Israel has gone through their judgment and punishment because of their sin and unfaithfulness and rebellion against God. And God is talking about the rescue plan. And here it is, this is one is going to come. There is going to be a rescue plan in place and one is going to come to prepare the rescue plan to be enacted. And so we find this about the proclamation about who he actually is. Now, if you take your Bibles and go over to Matthew chapter three, we wanna see here, not only their proclamations about John the Baptist, but John the Baptist himself, we're going to look at specifically one of the proclamations that he actually makes. And it's an unusual one and it doesn't seem fitting for what we're talking about, what we typically understand regarding it. But as we take some time, I think by the end of it, uh, discussing, discussing it, we'll see exactly what it is that he is talking about. So Matthew chapter 3, verse number 1, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. This is what he's preaching. This is his proclamation. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So I want you to understand clearly here this morning that this proclamation that John the Baptist makes is what we would refer to as repentance. Repentance. Repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is near. And what God has been working on establishing since the beginning of time, the fall of man, and bringing his kingdom back into the right perspective for mankind and the rule over mankind, this is another part of that which is going to take place. This ministry of John doesn't really tell us when it began. We know that John was a little bit older than Jesus, and we know that basically Jesus, for 30 years, lived kind of a normal, typical life um, of a Jewish man. John the Baptist, though, a little bit different as far as his life is concerned. We don't know how long he was out in the wilderness preaching. The Bible never gives us that detail. But we do know that close to the time of Jesus' ministry beginning, that he begins to draw the attention of the religious leaders. In fact, if we were to read both here as well as in the first chapter of John, we find that the religious leaders go to find out who he's connected to. Who is this guy that's out in the wilderness that's gaining attention and people are leaving the city to go out and hear him and we hear that he's baptizing and this is all taking place very shortly before the ministry of Christ begins. In fact, we'll see a little bit later on that John actually baptizes Jesus himself, which initiates Jesus' earthly ministry for the next three plus years. But when we think about repentance and this proclamation of John, do you typically think about repentance as a means of preparation? I think typically we think about repentance and it's applied to sin when sin is kind of outed, when sin becomes made known to others. We might have confession. We might confess to others, I've sinned against you. And then there's repentance and we're wanting to see change and reconciliation and restoration. And that's kind of where we see repentance. But we don't typically think of it as um, preparation. It's more of a response. But John is not looking at repentance as a means of response, but rather as preparation, preparation for the coming Messiah. In fact, preparation for his kingdom. He's telling the people by saying, repent. He's saying, you need to get ready. Prepare yourselves because the king is coming. The Messiah is coming. We understand repentance in this way, that repentance is a change of mind or direction. Stacey and I were reading the other day in a 
another Advent uh, reading that we're doing throughout the month along with our devotionals uh, with the church. Um, an author, Lancelot Andrews, describes it this way. It is a kind of circling around. So get this in your mind. So repentance, it's a kind of circling around. To turn to the one by repentance from whom by sin we have turned away. So he describes that kind of as a circling around, a turning around back to the one that we have turned from. John was calling the people to prepare their hearts, their minds, and lives for the coming of Jesus, for the coming of his kingdom. We must uh, repent, uh, repent. That is our preparation for this Advent season for you and I. So just as John was calling people to repent, I think we can also be called to the same way. How are we preparing for God's kingdom? It is not fully revealed. It is continuing to be revealed, and it will be fully known in time to come. But are we prepared for it? Are we repenting for it? It's more than just celebrating a birth at the Christmas season, but it's actually preparing our own hearts. When you think about going to someone's birthday celebration, we typically think about, okay, I need to take a present and I need to drop it off, but I don't typically think about the preparation for their birthday. But here, when we think about the birth of Christ, there is preparation on our part. We need to be ready for the coming of the Messiah and that which he reflects. I, I thought about four different ways specifically that we could be ready in this proclamation. Number one, be ready in our hearts. That which we desire, that which we seek after, uh, ought to be the Lord himself. We need to fix our hearts upon him. The heart being the very center of our core being of all that we are and from which everything else flows from needs to be fixed upon Christ. So repentance, that is turning our hearts towards him. A second way is turning our minds. This is our thoughts and how our thoughts then affect our actions. But turning our minds from that which is earthly and temporal to that which is heavenly and eternal. We see Paul calling us to this kind of repentance on a regular basis. Specifically, I think about uh, Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 1, 2, and 3, when he says, you know, don't set your affections on things below, but rather set your affections on things above. What is Paul saying? Prepare yourself. Prepare yourself for eternal eternity, the eternal kingdom of God. A third way that we can prepare and repent is dealing with our plans. Rather than trying to control everything in our world according to how we want things to operate, according to our kingdom plans, we need to seek his kingdom. And we need to trust him. Do you remember Matthew chapter 6 towards the end, the very last, uh, one of the last verses there, 31 I think it is, where Matthew reminds us, Jesus actually speaking, and Matthew's recording his words, and he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things will be added unto you. So there is a sense where our plans, there is repentance, there's a turning to God and his plans and what he has for us. And then the last area that I would say where we could see repentance is with our hands. And this is the idea of preparing to act and to serve. It's a submission of all that we are to God to do with us however he chooses to do. I think it's very picturesque in the Christmas story. Numbers of people that were presented. Think of Joseph and Mary and Zacharias and Elizabeth, uh, Simeon. Uh, and others throughout the, the, the story where God called them to do things and they responded and acted as they were called to do. We also can prepare ourselves in the same way. So we see the proclamation, the prophecy in the Old Testament and John's proclamation to repentance. So second this morning, I want us to take a look at the idea of prayer. This prayer we're going to find in Luke chapter 1. So go back in your Bibles over to Luke chapter 1, if you would. And this is the story about Zacharias, where he is in the temple as a priest, and he's doing the priestly duties. That's the, the, the sacrifice of incense and the altar of incense where he is. And uh, it talks about how while he was serving there in the temple, people were gathered outside the temple. And here he is, an angel of the Lord appears to him. And uh, I wonder what that would be like. Can you imagine just kind of getting ready in the morning, and all of a sudden, stepping out of the bathroom and right there, the angel of the Lord begins speaking to you. What would your response be? Well, we find about um, Zacharias, his response. So verse 11, And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of the incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. I think that's my response. I would respond with fear. 
But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. Now, just think about that first place. Your prayer has been heard. If an angel of the Lord came and said that to you this morning, what prayer would your mind go to? I think Zacharias was having trouble remembering what prayer has been heard, or maybe there was a sense of uncertainty. Okay, my prayer was heard. Which prayer is that? But I love how the angel doesn't just leave him kind of wandering or wondering there what prayer it is, but he actually goes directly to what the prayer is. What is it about? That his wife, Elizabeth, would give birth to a son. Now, this was a prayer, and we see this within the context of the passage that probably was prayed long ago that, that Zacharias probably had forgotten he had even prayed and maybe even given up on, maybe even lost a little bit of faith in the midst of that unanswered prayer. Yet I love how the angel comes along and he says, your prayer, as though it was just prayed just now, was heard and answered, and your wife is going to give birth to a son. And he goes on, and begins to tell him what that son will do and what his calling will be. Zacharias has questions. He lacks faith there. We know that he is made a mute until the birth of his son, and we know that he names his son John, and we know all the uh, uproar that that in itself caused as well. But Zechariah had prayed long ago, but had forgotten that prayer and even had lost some faith along the way. He says, your prayer has been heard. He clarified what that prayer actually was. His prayer was focused, if you think back about Zacharias, his prayer was actually focused upon his own small world, his wife and him and the birth of a son. But I love how God's answer to his prayer actually was much, much bigger than that. In fact, when Zacharias was praying, his prayer was answered, and it was actually the fulfillment of a prophecy that was made 700 years ago. Can you imagine seeing the answer to that prayer? and seeing this being played out in front of you. See, I think many times we go to God in prayer, and we have very small expectations as far as God is concerned. But God desires to do much, much bigger things than we could ever imagine. Remember that uh, verse in Ephesians chapter 2, I think it's verse number 19, or 319, where Paul tells us that God desires to do above all that we could ever ask or think. What a great reminder when it comes even to our own prayer life. In prayer... God will often use also some of the most unlikely people to accomplish his purposes. Just think about Zacharias, Elizabeth, and John. Here we find Zacharias, who's been a faithful priest, but had lost faith along the way. My prayer wasn't answered. Not sure why. He continued to be faithful, but he had lost faith. I wonder, maybe you're here today and you can identify with Zacharias and you think, yes, I've asked God, but I've kind of lost faith. But I would encourage us this morning, don't give up because God is going to reveal how he's going to work and how he's going to answer those prayers that we have prayed to him. And we need to continue to be faithful to what he's called us to. Look at Elizabeth. Elizabeth, who had been mocked by her community, basically made a shame because she was barren. She never gave birth to a child. And so she was shamed based upon her barren womb and physically was hopeless because of her age. As she looked at herself, she said to herself, there is no way that I will ever overcome this shame. Yet we see God performing a miraculous act and allowing her to become pregnant and giving birth to John the Baptist. And then thinking about John the Baptist himself, who was set apart for service from the very beginning. Boy, you talk about a different child. He was definitely unique. He was unique not because of anything that he had done. He was unique because of God's design and intent for his life. This is a great thing to remember as well. So maybe we identify with Zacharias. Maybe we identify with Elizabeth. We've given up hope physically. There's no way we can do what we are asking God to even do in our lives. Or maybe we're like John the Baptist, where we are considered kind of strange and kind of odd, yet God is working in and through us for his great purposes for him to do as he desires to do. So I love that in prayer, that God will oftentimes use people, places, events, and things in ways that we would have never anticipated. When we pray, do we pray in faith? When we pray, do we pray trusting that God hears us and that God answers us? Do we pray allowing God to work in a way that will bring him glory? I was thinking about this in preparing for the message today. We, we talk about praying according to the will of God. 
what ultimately is the will of God, his desire, that his name would be glorified. And I think when we pray, if we are praying and we're saying, God, we desire that your name will be glorified, we can be confident that God is hearing our prayers and that God is answering our prayers as well. So we've seen the preparation, we've seen the prayer. Now let's take a moment and look at the praise that John gives. Go in your Bibles to John chapter 1. We'll see if I can get this reference right here. John chapter 1, and we're looking at John the Baptist again. So John, the writer of the book of John, is not the same as John the Baptist. He's different, but is recording in John chapter 1, the beginning of Christ's earthly ministry, some of the works and some of the efforts and what is going on with John the Baptist. If you look at verse 11, and you read down through verse uh, number 17, actually, if you go down, I want to go down to verse um, number 19, and then down through verse 29. And we're actually going to just focus on verse 29. Look at that. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So we find John the Baptist. He's been out in the wilderness baptizing. The religious leaders come out. They begin to question him. Who are you? Are you Elijah? Uh, or are you some other prophet? Or are you the Messiah? And John says, No, no, I am not a prophet. I am not the Messiah. Uh, I'm just come to prepare the way. In fact, he describes himself. He says, I am not even worthy to lace up the sandals of Jesus. Over in Matthew, he says, I'm not even worthy to carry the shoes of Jesus. He says, I'm basically nobody. I, I love that description that John gives of his own self because Jesus says, the greatest man to ever be born of woman. John says of himself, I'm nothing. I am wor not worthy to even carry his shoes. What a view of his own self. But more importantly, not only did he have a right view of himself, but he had a proper view of Jesus himself. And this is where we get into this idea of praise. Praise. I want you to think of praise this way. We, we often think about praise and we might think of songs and music, and that would be a form of praise, maybe even testimony. But in the very simple definition, when we come to praise, it is an act of encouraging one another in that which is true. An act of encouraging one another in that which is true. Now, if you just connect this back to song, this is one of the powerful things about song that we've mentioned many different times. But when we are singing songs, this is why it's so important that our music, our words speak to who God actually is and speak that which is true, not just our feelings and our, and our thoughts and our opinions, but what is true about who God is and what he reveals about himself. We are actually repeating to one another, encouraging and affirming one another what is true. This is why singing together is actually such a valuable thing. And you can sing in your own homes and you can be singing out loud. As you sing, you hear yourself singing. You're affirming these truths to your own selves. So it's an act of encouraging one another towards that which is true. We go back in Matthew chapter 3. At the end of the baptism of Jesus, he comes up out of the water and God speaks here and he affirms something that is true. He affirms that Jesus is his son. He says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We see that as the first act of praise regarding Jesus. But here we see the second act of praise, and that is John who is pointing to Jesus and saying, this is the son of God. This is the lamb of God. We are affirming and praising something both to ourselves and to those that are around us. John very clearly was affirming to everyone that he saw this Jesus is the Messiah, the Lamb of God. God himself was affirming that his son, this Jesus, was truly his son, and he was fully satisfied in him. But the question to us is, what are we giving praise to? And even more so, the thing that we're giving praise to, because we are all worshiping and praising something, we are all affirming something to be true in our lives, is the thing that we are praising actually praiseworthy. That is, is it worthy of the praise that we are giving to it? Why don't you just consider three things as we close out the message here this morning. Number one, praise points our own heart to the object of our praise. So if our object of praise is God himself, as we are praising him, what it does is it just reaffirms our hearts. It points our hearts, our thoughts, and our minds towards the one whom we are praising. But if I am praising myself or I'm praising those that are around me, uh, and lifting up and saying, this is where my hope actually is, then my heart's actually going to be turned towards those things as well. And think about that, as it turns away from those things, 
or turns towards those things that turns away from God himself. So praise points our own hearts to the object of our praise. But not only that, but praise points the hearts of others to the object of our praise as well. So in my home, for instance, if I am praising God before my family, what it's doing is also pointing their attention to the object of my praise. I was thinking of a kind of a simple illustration to help us understand this as well. And I know we're probably thinking like, okay, does that mean we don't ever have to praise other people? Well, let's think about it this way. If you have a child in your home and they're doing their work, and especially in this time of distance learning, which is extraordinarily hard, and it's been very, very difficult for many students to get their work done and to kind of give a perspective as to what's going on as far as daily life is concerned. And we know that as adults that we're struggling with that. So if we're struggling with that, no doubt our kids are struggling with that. But let's just say that your child does something very well as a student. You go to them and say, oh, you are such a great student. You are praising them for the work that they have done. Most of us would say, okay, well, that's not a bad thing, is it? But think about it this way. If I'm pointing to them and saying, you are such a great student, where does their focus go? Their focus ends up going on themselves. And they begin to rely upon themselves and their own goodness and their own ability to do that which is before them. So in a sense, we are praising them and turning our attention towards them and encouraging them to turn their attention towards themselves. You say, well, how do we rightly praise them? Well, I think maybe something simple this way. We could say something along this line to say, this is amazing how God has given you the ability to do so well in this area of your academics. So in one sense, you've acknowledged that they have done well, but you help them to realize that the object of the praise is not their own ability, but the object of the praise is to God who has given them the ability to be able to do the things that that is before them. And what this does is it takes their hope, not placing it in themselves and their own goodness, but it takes their hope and places in God who truly is good. Now, I know that's a simplistic illustration, but I think it helps us to begin to understand that the object of our praise is what we end up finding our hope in. And what we find ourselves praising is what we're pointing others to praise as well. Well, the third point, not only are we thinking about what we worship and praise and what John was praising, but I want us, or what to, we point others to praise, but I want us to also think about what John was praising. John praises Jesus as the Lamb of God, both encouraging his own heart to believe and encouraging others to believe as well. As we prepare for this Christmas season, the coming of the Messiah, one of the things that we can be doing is praising the God who has sent his Son, both in our own lives and around those that are around us and pointing them to the one hope that there truly is. It is a great season for preparation, preparing our own hearts through repentance, turning our eyes back towards the Lord, our hearts and our hands, of giving uh, the proclamation of making this known to others, of praying towards God in faith, knowing that he answers, and then of praising, turning our attention towards him, the object of our hope. God, I thank you for the truth of who you are, I thank you for one like John the Baptist who prepared the way for the coming of the Messiah. May our hearts also be prepared. May we be turning towards you and finding our great hope in you during this season as we prepare our hearts for the coming of your kingdom. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.